As American as apple pie is a common phrase used to describe things that are undeniably American. But is it actually? First of all, apples themselves aren't American. When colonists arrived in North America, they found only crab apple trees, and if you've ever tried to eat a crab apple, you probably know that it wouldn't be very nice in a pie. The most likely ancestor of apples as we know them today can still be found in Asia, the wild genus Malus cyversi. Alexander the Great is said to have discovered dwarfed apples in Kazakhstan and brought them back to Macedonia in 328 BC, but there is fossilized evidence of apples dating as far back as the Iron and Stone Ages in Switzerland and other parts of Europe. The Romans are thought to have introduced apples to England, and from there, American colonists started spreading them throughout the New World. Apple seeds were spread along trade routes, but the early trees were unable to bear much fruit due to a lack of the European honeybee, Apis mellifera. This type of honeybee was shipped to the Americas in 1622. It was much more prolific than the native honeybee, the Apis mellipona, which produces less than one kilogram of honey each year, compared to the Apis mellifera's 50 kilograms. As apple trees depend upon pollen nation to fruit, apple trees flourished after the introduction of the European bee. By the time apples arrived in the Americas, cooking with apples was nothing new. In fact, the first recorded recipe for apple pie was written in 1381 in England and called for figs, raisins, pears, and saffron in addition to apples. Early apple pie recipes were a lot different than what we know today as they rarely called for sugar, an expensive and hard to get item at the time. Originally, this apple pie was served in a pastry called a coffin, which was not normally meant for consumption and was only supposed to be meant as a container for the filling. Similarly, Dutch apple pies, the type usually decorated with a lattice of pastry on top, have been around for centuries. A recipe for apple pie very similar to today's recipes appeared in a Dutch cookbook in 1514. A variety of other recipes appeared in French. French, Italian, and German recipe collections dating back to before the American colonies were settled. Even when the American colonists were finally able to produce enough apples to cater to more widespread consumption, they were initially mostly used to make hard cider rather than pie. Apple pies generally call for cooking quality apples, varieties that are crisp and acidic, and such apples hadn't been developed in the American orchards. Perhaps one of the contributors to making apple pies an American dessert is John Chapman, a Massachusetts man you probably know better as Johnny Appleseed. As we've noted before, born in Massachusetts in 1774, Chapman traveled throughout America's frontier, planting apple orchards largely in Pennsylvania and Ohio, and becoming something of a legend and American folk hero even in his own time. Chapman's beloved apples became American by association. Much more significantly, apple pie was cemented in American history by a 1902 newspaper article that claimed no pie-eating people can be permanently vanquished. American soldiers during World War II also did their part to popularize the stereotype. When asked by journalists why they were going to war, the common slogan used for a response was for mum and apple pie, which later gave rise to as American as motherhood and apple pie. Because most Americans are suckers for patriotism, apple pie was quickly adopted as the American thing by the 1960s, as American as apple pie, dropping the most obviously not unique American thing of motherhood. While that is the widely held origin of the rather incorrect phrase, an alternative hypothesis sometimes put forth as to the origin of the expression is that it actually predated the soldier's usage and derivation of for mum and apple pie. In this origin story, the expression was actually put forth as part of a marketing campaign by apple growers trying to get people to eat more apples. This was also the origin of the expression, an apple a day keeps the doctor away. At the time that expression first popped up, a large percentage of apples in America were still used to make hard Cider, but with the women's temperance movement and eventual prohibition, apple growers started trying to promote the apple as more of a food item, and the apple a day expression was one of the byproducts of that. It's also very possible that the previously mentioned no pie eating people can be permanently vanquished and similar such quotes were part of this push. However, despite our sincerest efforts, we were unable to find any first hand documented evidence to back up that later hypothesis for the exact expression as American as apple pie nor instances of the exact expression predating World War II. As there is first-hand documented evidence to back up the soldier origin theory and the expression didn't become prevalent until the 1950s and 1960s, long after the hard cider issue was a problem, we're going with the soldier theory being the true origin, though it seems probable enough that marketers may have eventually had their hands in it. And the theory is somewhat plausible with the push to get people to eat more apples in the early 20th century. In the end, America seems to have taken the apple pie and run with it, making it more popular. 
While American apple orchards had a bumpy road to producing good apples, America eventually became one of the largest producers of apples in the world. Nearly every farm grew apples during the United States' infancy, and today over 220 million bushels of apples are produced every year there. It's only second to China, which produces roughly half of the world's apples. And now for some bonus facts. When researching such things for a living, you quickly find that advertising campaigns are the root of an amazing amount of traditions. Even things like the fact that today in the Western world, it's not common to have children fully potty trained until they're three-ish years old. This is around double what it was before the disposable diaper was invented, and those companies making them heavily pushed that it was bad to potty train children sooner, even getting doctors to claim it was mentally traumatizing, or at least saying that doctors said this in ad campaigns, something that many people leave today despite the lack of any evidence. Later, there was a push that it wasn't even possible to train your children on the potty earlier. For your reference, in certain regions of Asia and Africa, 12 to 18 months is still the norm for fully potty training most children, particularly day potty training. In 1957 in the US, the average start time was 11 months, with a large percentage of children fully trained by 18 months and 90% by 24 months. In Vietnam today, having babies mostly day potty trained by 9 months is the norm. And now for another bonus fact. Speaking of ad campaigns, Theodore Geisel, Dr. Seuss, once worked in advertising with his most famous ad campaign being one he created for Standard Oil, who owns Flitz, a popular insecticide of the day. The campaign slogan was Quick Henry, the Flitz, which while probably not something you've ever heard of today, was more or less the got milk or where's the beef of the day. Speaking of got milk in 1993, concerned about the steady decline of milk consumption over recent years, the newly created nonprofit California Milk Pro Processor board approached the advertising agency of Goodby, Silverstein, and partners seeking fresh ideas to get America excited about drinking their product. The agency found the request quite a challenge since, in the words of Jeff Goodby, We've all tried it. Most have already owned some. Milk is not new. It is not improved. There is very little to say about it. And so, despite years of experience, the mad men and women of Goodby, Silverstein, and partners were at a loss for where to start when, during a focus group, one woman noted that the only time I even think about milk is when I run out of it. Which led Goodby to write down the now famous line, got milk. Still not convinced they had the winner, some members of the firm were convinced that not only was the phrase grammatically questionable, its production hadn't required much effort on their part. It seemed too simplistic to present to the milk processor board. Others thought that the campaign should instead recognize that people almost always drink milk with other foods, like cookies or cereal, and wanted the ads to focus on milk and XYZ. Ultimately, however, perhaps recognizing that brevity can be the soul of wit, they stuck with the two-word question. With the minuscule case, set it in its now iconic typeface, and began telling stories of how much life can suck when you run out of milk. Generally involving an individual caught in the middle of eating something sticky or dry when he realizes he's out of milk, the commercials typically ended with the distraught character looking pathetic and a narrator asking if you are sufficiently prepared to avoid this type of calamity with the simple question, got milk? While many of the commercials are classic, none is more well known than the first in the series, which was directed by none other than Michael Bay. Yep, that Michael Bay. Sometimes called Got Milk slash Aaron Burr for those not familiar, the television ad opens with classical music playing while the camera scans a large apartment crammed full with Alexander Hamilton memorabilia. As the song wraps up, the sole occupant of the apartment finishes spreading peanut butter on a slice of bread and takes an enormous bite, just as the announcer says that the day's $10,000 question is, who shot Alexander Hamilton? in that famous duel. Now several shots of Hamilton Burr collectibles are shown, revealing that the answer was not only Aaron Burr, but that the peanut butter eating character knows this as well. The phone rings, the announcer asks our character the question, and he answers, but because of the peanut butter gumming up his mouth, his answer is unintelligible. As his big chance slips away, the character goes for a glass of milk to clear his palate, only to realize the carton is empty. The announcer cuts the call, having not heard the correct answer, and as the screen fades to black, the character, now broken-hearted, continues to try to articulate the answer to no avail, and then his apartment dramatically explodes. We're joking about that one, but it is Michael Bay. The commercial ends with the familiar phrase on screen, got milk. Wildly popular, Bay's commercial won the Silver Lion at Cannes, as well as the Grand Prix Clio for Commercial of the Year. Within two years, the milk processor education program, Milk Pap, was distributing it nationwide, and by the mid-1990s, more than 91% of American adults were familiar with the Got Milk campaign, which eventually morphed into other forms, such as with milk-mustachioed celebrities in a variety of poses. 
So I really hope you found that video interesting. If you did, please do hit that thumbs up button below and don't forget to subscribe. And as always, thank you for watching.